I'd like to introduce our next speaker here. Um, speaking of AI, this next session is going to focus on that. Sid Dobrin is professor and chair in the Department of English at the University of Florida. Known as one of the world's most sought after academic experts on AI and as a global AI thought leader, Sid has delivered more than 45 talks on AI and Gen AI to academic and industry audiences this past year. He is the founding director of the Trace Innovation Initiative at University of Florida and has been named a digital thought leader by Adobe. He is the author and editor of numerous books and articles, including Talking About Generative AI, A Guide for Educators, and the first AI-focused writing textbook, AI in Writing. He serves as a member of the Florida Institute of National Security, part of the University of Florida's AI Initiative, and as such was invited to attend the U.S. Department of Defense's Task Force, Lima Industry and Academia Challenge Day. Sid writes for several fishing magazines, including Florida Sportsman's, Guy Harvey Magazine, Saltwater Sportsman's, and others. He is co-owner of the Inventive Fishing and host of the, of the um, sorry, of the Fishing Professor Rodcast. Sid is also the author of Fishing Gone, Saving the Ocean Through Sport Fishing and Distant Casting, Words and Ways of the Saltwater Fishing Life. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sid Dobrin, and he will be speaking with you this morning about AI. Thank you, Sid. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Can you all hear me? Am I live? Am I hot now? How's everybody doing this morning? Wow, those are some bright lights. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, this is my first RBFF uh, marketing event, though I have been involved with uh, American Sport Fishing Association for about a decade now. And over, as Stephanie mentioned, over the last year, I've given somewhere between 45 and 60 talks about artificial intelligence, particularly generative artificial intelligence. And one of the things about giving that many talks is I usually like to be able to revise the talk to the audience right at the last minute. And the way RBFF has set this up, I had to send my slides to them last week. So there were things that came up in conversation last night that I would love to address today, but they're not gonna be in the slides simply because I wasn't able to revise the slides before today. Now, some of you may have heard me give a very similar talk um, either at ICAST or at uh, ASA Summit or at National Professional Anglers Association. So if you've heard some of the first part of this, the first part of the talk is gonna be to demystify what a lot of these technologies are. Please don't call out the punchlines to my jokes. You know, let, me, let me get through the stuff that I do regularly. The second part of it will be geared specifically to this audience and to state marketing. Um, part of the reason that I'm able to do the first part of this talk over and over again is because a lot of that information doesn't change. But one of the most important things my dad taught my brothers and I uh, was that uh, you don't need new material, you need new audiences. And so I'm addressing you all as new audience. So in order to get this going, I wanna show, I wanna show a short video clip. There's no audio, so don't worry about the, uh, the hearing part of this. It's about 17 seconds long, and it's sort of how I think about artificial intelligence these days. So we're, we're working with a machine that doesn't necessarily understand our rules, that's playing by a new set of rules. And I love the fact that when they made this video, there's that pause as though the machine is thinking about what to do, which of course is an effect of how we tend to think about AI as somehow an entity that thinks. It doesn't. So this morning what I want to do is talk about generative AI particularly geared toward what we do in terms of marketing and state marketing. But I, I have to tell you, I love getting these invitations to come give all these talks. You know, AI is the big thing. Everybody wants to talk about AI. But I get these invitations. Hey, can you come talk to us about AI? Which is a massive subject, massive subject, like galactic-sized subject. We're only gonna be able to cover a tiny little bit 
of AI and Gen AI. So a lot of what I'll do today is to provoke you to think more about AI, particularly within the realm of what you do as state marketers. Um, and yes, I recognize that's not the Milky Way. That's not where we actually are. It is a metaphor. Not going to do it to you again. Uh, <laughs> it's just a visual metaphor. Now, the only reason that we're having a conversation about generative AI and the world right now is because in November of 2022, OpenAI dropped ChatGPT on us. And the only reason that that mattered was it was free. So all of a sudden, this thing, artificial intelligence, that was you know some weird science fiction or computer science kind of geeky thing became something that everybody had access to for free, and it changed how we're doing things. And it was an alarm clock to us. It sort of woke us up. And we all know that when an alarm clock goes off, we have possible three responses. There are those of us who are ready, jump up, ready to take on the challenge of the day. There are those of us who hit snooze alarm, who hit snooze alarm, not really ready. And then there are those of us who smash the alarm against the wall because we don't want to deal with it at all. And that's sort of been the three responses that we've had to generative artificial intelligence. So my objective today is first going to be to demystify what some of these technologies are, how they work, and then I want to talk about how we're going to deploy those technologies, okay? Now, had I been able to revise my slides and had I actually been thinking on my feet, I would have included more stuff about R3 specific. I would have been able, to, so we're gonna, we're gonna add R3 into all of this because it is so pertinent, particularly license sales and things like that, so we'll get to that. So whenever I talk about generative AI, I always wanna talk about it from two primary perspectives. First is the conceptual. What does this mean to us to what happens when we start using Gen AI. What are the big questions? The why are we doing this? The what if I do this? All those big conceptual questions. And then I like to ask those questions of how are we going to apply it? How are we gonna actually use Gen Tech and Gen AI? Now, there's a third way that I really like to think about AI also, but in industry talks or in academic talks, we don't get to it as much, but I do wanna mention it to this group in particular, and that's material AI. And that is all these devices that we use require a lot of material. And there's impact on the world from these materials. Everything from the mining of the minerals and, for instance, in the Congo, the uh, conflict minerals that are required to run the devices that you all have in your hands or in front of you and how those fuel civil wars, all the way to the other end of that, to the e-waste and what happens to our devices when we're done using them. That, to me, is an important part of my own conservation-mindedness. But for me, particularly where the material comes into play, is that the server farms that are used to drive a lot of these AI technologies that we're gonna be talking about, they generate an immense amount of heat. And so companies like Microsoft and like Google are starting to experiment with underwater uh, server farms to offset the heat. And those of you from uh, coastal states will know that the last thing we need to be doing is heating an already heated ocean. So those are things that I'm very interested in, but we won't be able to dive into them very deeply um, or at all today. So one of the interesting things about when OpenAI dropped ChatGPT was it made generative AI focus specifically on writing because it was primarily or is primarily a writing generating AI. But the fact of the matter is, is that generative AI touches just about every single kind of content producing that we make. So from this little orbit of AI graphic that I've put up here, we know that AI is interacting with us on our phone when we do things like chat bots, customer service bots, those sorts of things. Gen AI is very good at math and it does a lot of computational work. It is also really, really good at music production. And in a lot of talks, one of the, well, particularly when we're doing workshops, I'll take a, an app and we'll come up with a theme and in about 30 seconds we'll make a new song. No instruments, no music, no human being involved. And music generation is uh, pretty interesting from AI. My oldest son is a sophomore at University of Colorado and he's in the music school there and they're now taking AI classes both for composition and performance of music. So audio becomes very important. Like I said, writing the center icon here, 
It's also become very, very widespread in film production and film editing. It makes film editing very easy. It's also really, really good at coding. It codes at a rate so much faster than a human that you can turn out new programs very, very quickly. And as I'll show you, it's also very, very big in image generation and image revision. So when we talk about generative AI, AI that makes stuff, we're not just talking about writing and content. And I was glad that Shama introduced that concept of using Gen AI for writing content, because we're going to come back to that quite a bit throughout the, the rest of my talk. Here's part of the reason we're also having this conversation, is that when OpenAI dropped ChatGPT, the velocity at which people started using this was unseen. We had never seen anything like this before. It took ChatGPT five days before a million people were using it. The closest to getting a million users before that was it took Instagram two and a half months before a million people started using it. If we continue to look at that kind of a velocity, we know that it took ChatGPT two months before there were 100 million monthly users using this app. Closest thing to that was uh, when TikTok launched, but it took them nine months before they had 100 million users. So then if we start to look at what the updated numbers are, and we look, this is from just a couple of weeks ago, we now know that ChatGPT, OpenAI, has 1.7 billion page visits every month. That means somebody's logging, of 1.7 billion people are logging on to use ChatGPT every month. That's an increase of 1.1 billion users since January of last year. That's absolutely incredible use, uh, use basis. There are 180.5 180 million monthly users and 100 million people using this on a weekly basis. 15% of the ChatGPT users are from the US. Uh, most are males between 18 and 34 years old. One of the things I want us to do today as we're talking about, ch about this is ChatGPT dropped this in our laps because it was free, as I've said. But the fact of the matter is, I want to try to disavow ChatGPT as the representative of Gen AI. I don't like that we're turning it into the Band-Aid Xerox, uh, Kleenex kind of a brand that oversees everything else, and you'll see why as I move on. So right now, more than 92% of Fortune 500 companies are using ChatGPT in ways like Shama talked about with uh, automating uh, email responses, those kinds of things. Now, one of the reasons for that level of use is also what is happening with Gen AI and overall productivity. World Economic Forum is estimating that a year from now, companies that are using Gen Tech will increase productivity by 40%. Now, I, of course, want to ask the question, well, if I increase productivity by 40%, does that mean that I have 40% more free, 40% more work, 40% income raise? So those numbers are interesting to play with. But we're seeing this deployed across all industries right now. And interestingly, now about 53% of the people who engage Gen AI can't tell that it was Gen Tech produced. And I'll, I'll show you some more of that. Um, I'll add to that also that that's actually not new. Uh, a lot of the media outlets that we're very familiar with have been using generative tech for almost a decade now. And as an example of that, um, the Los Angeles Times has a, a bot called QuakeBot that's tied directly into the USGS data center, and if there's an earthquake anywhere in the vicinity of LA, the bot goes live, takes the information from the USGS uh, data source, writes an article that's then published in the LA Times immediately online and then in the print version that day without a human editor ever being involved with it, and it's been doing this for about 10 years. But if we look at Bloomsburg, if we look at Forbes, if we look at well, ESPN just you know, had to reduce the amount of AI they were using. Um, but if we look at any major news uh, uh, provider, media provider, that they've been using Gentech for about a decade now in significant numbers, upwards of something like 60%, depending on what outlet you're, you're looking at, has either G G Gentech enhanced or Gentech produced content. And we're very used to reading that without questioning it or being aware of it. So let's demystify the process of what Gen Tech is. 
So very quickly, very easily, this is very superficial, so all of those of you with computer science background, don't ding me for being really, really superficial here because we don't have the time to get into it. So a computer program is very simple. Computer program are the set of instructions that tells the computer what to do. Artificial intelligence, and by the way, the big mistake that Turing made 50 years ago in developing the idea of artificial intelligence was calling it artificial intelligence. It has nothing to do with artificial intelligence. It is a complex computer program. That's all that it is. It's not thinking. I hate that we anthropomorphize it when we talk about training it. But what an AI does is it allows uh, computers to take on tasks that we thought were, were relegated just to a kind of human problem solving, human intelligence. That includes things like understanding language, particularly natural language rather than coded language. It also you know, does things like recognize objects, it makes decisions, it does problem solving. Basically what artificial intelligence is, is a system for analyzing a whole bunch of data and then answering questions based on that data. That's a very big oversimplification, but that's what AI does. What generative AI does is it takes all of that data that the AI can analyze, and then based on that analysis, it looks for patterns that repeat in the data, and then it reorganizes that data and outputs something that looks original, but what it really is is parts of everything that it's been able to find in its data set, okay? So real quick, here's how it works. You take something like ChatGPT and you write a prompt. You ask it to do something. You know, uh, write an essay about Moby Dick. And then what the bot does, the AI does, is it goes through every bit of data that it has access to and looks for patterns that repeat about that prompt. You know, everything it can find about Moby Dick. And it scrubs through all that data and it looks for patterns and it elevates those patterns that have been used the most and it starts to pull from that pieces until it comes up with something that it can output that looks different from those patterns but fits within those patterns. Now, I've got that scrub process marked off in a black box here because the narrative that we tell ourselves is that this is a black box technology, that we don't know what it's doing. We do, we wrote the algorithms for it. We know exactly what it's doing. But what's interesting to me about that black box isn't just that it is a technology and algorithm doing something, it's what happens outside of that box. Because in order for a Gen AI tool to work, it can only work with the information it has. So we think about all of the information that a Gen Tech bot doesn't have. All of the data that's not there. So I have students at UF who will tell me, well, if it's not available online, it's not viable research. And then I look at the 17 libraries that we have on campus and the you know thousands of years of knowledge making that humans have developed that haven't been digitized or put in to the data set. So there's a lot of information then that's not available with something like OpenAI because OpenAI's data set is what? the internet, right? Which should already be a red flag, right? If it's getting all of its information from the internet, data, so chat GPT finds a way around and then another block comes in here. Um, with images, there's a group at MIT that created a platform called uh, Glaze that blocks uh, artist images from being f f picked up by uh, chat GPT bot. And so right now, we're seeing that the notion of chat GPT providing us accurate information is problematic, not just because it's being blocked, but the other thing is, is chat GPT's open AI bot 
can only access information starting two years ago. So there's no immediate up-to-date information. So part of what I'm getting at as moving away from ChatGPT as the Band-Aid here is also the idea that it's also not reliable. And I'll show you some more examples of how to think about that. Now, what makes it interesting is right now we're seeing about a thousand new Gen AI and AI platforms being released each week. And what makes that interesting is rather than using the internet as its data set, most of these platforms are either customizable to a company's own proprietary data. Um, that proprietary LLM, large language model, is what you call the data set from a Gen AI. And so now we're seeing companies develop their own data sets that they can use GenTech for, with, which are generally subscri subscription-based platforms, so you can buy your way into these, and they're always very disciplinary or company-specific, which means that rather than using ChatGPT as your platform for doing AI stuff, what we're seeing across industry are the use of these, these uh, subscription-based proprietary platforms that allow you to do the things you want to do with your own vetted data. Because the most important part about all of this is starting with good data. And if you're starting with the internet, there may be some good data in there, but most of it is not good data. And so being able to develop your own data sets, your own LLMs, then you have faith in what that data is putting out, okay? So you may have seen recently New York Times is currently suing OpenAI over access to public data. There's a big copyright issue going on. We've got a lot to figure out in terms of the legality of this. Uh, just as a side note for content creators, and I'm gonna show you uh, some stuff about uh, image generation. Uh, currently, you cannot copyright an AI-generated image. And so images that are being shared and moved don't fall under copyright the way that uh, other images do. So, I try very hard when talking about emerging and evolving technologies, not to make promises, not to make predictions, but I'm gonna make one prediction for you. 15 years ago, none of us, no industry in the world, would have anticipated that we need something called a social media marketing manager. And now, not only do we have specific jobs for that, but that gets tied into a lot of what we do in our organizations. Uh, you know, even Glenn, when he started his talk, was, you know, making posts, right, that there's got to be that constant uh, availability on social media. So here's my one prediction today, and that is the next thing will be a need for prompt engineers. And what a prompt engineer is, is somebody who knows how to interact with the AI to write the prompts to get it to find the information that you need and get the output that you need. So my example of write an essay about Moby Dick is a terrible prompt because it has absolutely no details involved in it. So you could get anything at the end of that when it puts stuff out. So what prompt engineering is, is a way of understanding how do I get the AI to output what I want from it. And what you have to realize is AI is not a magic box. It doesn't just go poof, here's what you want. It has to be guided and directed, and learning how to write prompts is a very big key part of doing that. And so short, vague prompts get you crappy output. Being able to know how to use the language to get exactly what you want. The other thing about that is that no AI, Gen AI, is a one-shot thing. You don't write, you know, write me an essay about Moby Dick and get what you want. You then have to respond it and say, use less verbs or whatever you decide to do with it. And so you're constantly revising the output. Now, keep in mind that that's a conversational thing. It's a, an iterative thing. That's why ChatGPT is chat, is because it's like a conversation with the bot. And then prompt whispering is those really nuanced abilities to get the gen tech to do what it is you need and want it to do. So let's talk about hallucinations. What I mean by hallucinations is tying back to that open AI internet data thing. AI gets stuff wrong a lot. So a while back when I was working with, starting work with AI, I asked ChatGPT to write an academic biography, biography of me. A short one, we have to turn these in when we apply for grants or it goes on the back of a book you know, about the author. And it did. And 100% of everything in it was wrong. 
However, if you didn't know me, if you didn't know my work, you would not know it was wrong. It sounds like something that I should do. I should have written this book. I should have attended this. I should have done this. But I never did any of those things. And so a hallucination is when the AI gives you something that it thinks, again, wrong verb, but that's how we talk about it, is what you're looking for, but it doesn't have the information to actually give you that. What it does is it works with statistical guesses, what's the most likely thing that you're wanting from this, and then it fills in proxy variables, stuff that it can sock into the patterns to match up what it sees as the patterns rather than what's accurate. So what it can't do, a la Mr. Hand and Spicoli, is it will not, Gen AI will never tell you, I don't know, okay? So let me give you an example. And we'll make this visual so it's easier to see. So when I first started playing with ChatGPT, I asked it to give me 10 facts about salmon. I like salmon, I like salmon fishing. I try to go salmon fishing in Alaska every year. I buy, you know, that's, we were talking last night, the interesting thing about fishing license sales is you, most of us who are, what did we decide, avid was the word, avid anglers, that we're buying licenses in six and seven states as we travel around. So I spend a lot of time in Alaska salmon fishing. I've even got salmon tattoo. And I asked ChatGPT for 10 facts about salmon. And this was one of the facts that it gave me. Salmon swim in rivers. Now, it's kind of hard to argue with, I agree. So I thought, all right, what happens if we take this fact from OpenAI and we go to its sister platform, Dolly, which is an image generating platform, and I sock this in there and I say, I want an image of salmon swim in rivers. And here's what we get. <laughs> now, there's a reason that this is what we got at that time. Because when ChatGPT is looking through patterns to draw from, at the time, there were more images that were culinary than there were ichthyological, fishing, outdoor, whatever other tag we want to put on it. So it saw that notion of salmon, the image repeated most often was the culinary image, so that's what it drew from. However, as more people started working with ChatGPT, and it trains every time you use it, it learns from what you ask, it, it updates itself, it began to recognize that that verb swims indicates something specific, an action related to a fish, rather than it's just swimming in gravy or swimming you know, in sauce. It recognized that when you ask for a salmon to be swimming, that you're looking for a live. And so quite literally, uh, February 10th, I redid this on Dolly. These are kind of salmonoid-ish. It's uh, not quite an accurate salmon. But it's now meeting the prompt more head on because now it gets what you're asking from it. Uh, Firefly also just uploaded uh, on February 10th, I did these. Uh, they, they turned out okay, but again, still not, they're, they weren't, they're not really salmon. They're, they're kind of a non-existent salmonoidish fish. So where that leaves us in terms of image generation is no longer is a picture worth a thousand words, but a picture is worth however many words it takes you to get the AI to do what you want it to do. I will tell you, I have a lot of fun on social media using Gen AI to make antique lures that never existed and then posting them and asking people if they can either identify them or tell me their value. And the barrage of responses of experts who want to tell me you know, what these images are, what, what lures these are. Um, I don't know if any of you saw this, but last April, this picture, the electrician, this photograph, won Sony Photography World Picture of the Year. And um, when it was announced as the best photograph of the year across the world, the guy who uh, submitted it said, hang on, sorry, no, this is an AI-generated image. And uh, he pulled it, of course, from the, from the competition. He said, I entered this as a cheeky monkey to see if the world's best photography experts can tell the difference between AI and photography, and you can't. So with all that in mind, let's talk about how we're going to use this stuff. Let's talk about how we're going to deploy it. And I want to focus it on state marketing, 
with AI augmentation because one of the things I want you to take away from this today is that Gen AI is not the magic box. It's not just going to make what you want because you ask it to make what you want. We need to think about Gen AI as augmentation rather than automation. That it works with a human machine collaboration. And if you are moving away from taking the authority over whatever content it's producing and what you're putting out for your company, your organization, then you're deferring the work to the AI, which as I just showed you, doesn't get stuff right. And so we have to think about this as a collaboration between the machine and what it can do to make you more efficient in what you do without it doing everything for you. We're not there yet. Right? All AI requires, all kinds of AI requires three things. It requires an immense amount of data, and really it requires an immense amount of vetted, good, reliable data. It requires lots of computer processing power, and it requires an expert, somebody who knows not just how to use the AI, but how to adjust whatever's coming out with it. So we've seen right there with the images, Gen AI is fantastic for content creation. It can pretty much make anything for you, anything that you want to put out there. Um, Shama pointed to Adobe Express page. I serve as an Adobe Digital Thought Leader. Express is fantastic. It will generate content for you very rapidly. It's got tons of design templates, very easy to use. But if you start looking for other platforms, like I said, there are literally thousands of new platforms coming out each week. And what you want to find is a platform that works for the kind of content you want to put out there. And again, the free stuff, like OpenAI, is where you're going to run into your problems. It's when you start subscribing and using platforms that you have more control over, control of the data, that you're going to find content production and content creation much more efficient. Um, platforms like Jasper, uh, or a really great, Jasper gets used across companies a lot more, I think, than ChatGPT does because of its accuracy. Uh, but basically, with content creation, anything you want to make, a film, a picture, a song. Um, I did a demo, actually, at ASA Summit where we had ChatGPT uh, draft up a description of what the American Sport Fishing Association does. We took that content, put it into a voice generator, had a, a woman speak. And there, there's a, there are so many uh, text-to-speech platforms out there that you can really pick the nuance of what kind of accent you want. You want male, female, kid, adult, you know, and really hone that audio output. And so what was it? What did it take us? Maybe 45 seconds? We had an audio output that could have been used in a podcast that was accurate information. And we could actually then take that audio output and dump it into something like Descript and have it animate a video. So now I've got video content as well, and it does it you know, almost instantaneously. So if you're, if you're a content creator, AI, this is where AI is doing a lot of the work. AI is being used a lot and is very, very helpful in interactive websites. Um, I was thinking about this last night and the kinds of ways that chatbots can be used on those licensed vendor web pages to be able to answer questions about license purchases, uh, about things like, uh, you know, annual versus a lot of the stuff that we put on our web pages in text form now can be interactive as well. And so there's a lot of things that you can do to your state web pages that create interactivity much quicker using the AI. You've got people coming to your state, and you know I've got this framed with the state park. You know what's the problem with trying to get customized uh, slides for wildlife agencies? None of you are consistent in uh, having the same signage. <laughs> Everybody's got different signage. So I went with the state park kind of uh, motif here. But the chatbots for visitor assistance is something that we're starting to see more and more useful. Uh, same kind of thing as a customer service uh, chatbot where you want to call and ask questions. And I know that frustrates a lot of people because I want to talk to a human, but a lot of the mundane, repetitive stuff 
becomes very, uh, very easy to deploy using a, uh, a chatbot. Social media engagement, what Shama was talking about, you can automate so much of that stuff. How many of you, when you're doing social media, are asking yourself, why am I spending so much time on this? Right, that I've got to scroll through and find who should I respond to, or that I've got to come up with my, my however many tweets or posts in order to keep myself in everybody's algorithm. You can automate all that very easily, have the content produced. It makes things so much easier. Um, the one thing that I've been thinking more about in terms of the conversation here today and what we were talking about last night is the ability to use the data that you already have about people in your databases who are buying licenses and you can see when they're renewing, how often they're renewing, those sorts of things, that Gentech is very good for developing personalized marketing campaigns. So for instance, you can make, uh, make some assumptions about you know, the Smith family that seems to buy a license every year right before walleye open. And so to be able to take that kind of personalized information rather than what I assume most states who do licenses do like we do in Florida, where I get my update that says, your snook permit is going to expire in two months, you need to re-update that. You can now actually make that even more personal rather than just the licensure. You can direct that to, hey, I see the last two years that you bought, uh, you updated your license that time's coming up and you can make it much more personalized and interactive uh, in order to, uh, to, to really focus on the demographic and the specific interest of uh, the people that you're working with. So one of the techs, the technologies that I work with a lot is augmented reality. And um, augmented reality is when you're looking through a device and it's overlaying information into the real world. So some of my students and I created an AR for a uh, wetland that didn't have enough signage explaining what was being conveyed on this wetland. And uh, so you could take your phone and walk around and it would give you information. And now you can do, uh, using facial recognition software, you can do species recognition, species identification, those kinds of things, so that you can create these interactive experiences for people in your state. Um, so one of the ones, you know, particularly we've got a lot of the apps that are coming out, uh, coming out now in fishing to be able to identify species, to be able to identify regulations, those kinds of things. You can do that with an AI AR overlay. Um, these things are just, they're fascinating, they're amazing, and you can do them with people's phones. You don't need a lot of, a lot of big tech to do that. Um, you also have opportunity for a lot of crowdsourced content. One of the things that AI and Gen AI are very good at is analyzing data. And so a lot of the data that you're getting already from uh, folks who are visiting your web pages, buying licenses, all the kinds of questions that are being asked, that you can start encouraging people who are in your state to answer questions and provide data that can then be mined to find specific things. Uh, and AI will do it for you almost instantaneously. Um, Shama used that example of her asking uh, AI, what are the three or four big uh, things I need to know about you know, subject X or whatever that. You can do those kinds of large, broad analysis things, but what G uh, Gentech allows you to do is really focus down on your own data to be able to do that as well, to ask the things that you didn't know how to, how to find that kind of information before. Um, you can also use geo-targeted advertising, that stuff can be pushed out on people's phones when they hit a particular location. So you could literally have, uh, if somebody pulls into a recreational fishing area or a place to rent boats, where they get a ping that says, hey, if you're thinking about fishing here, you need to recognize that there's no license sales here on this property. You need to go about two miles back down the road to a place that you can buy your license before you fish here. You can have those kinds of very personalized, very locale-driven uh, information distribution that way. Um, and yet, I mean, data analysis for marketing, every time you're launching marketing campaigns, you're also gathering data about who's paying attention to them, who's following through with them, and that kind of information, that the ability to analyze that data very quickly and then turn around and use it real time to generate other content is always going to be very helpful. Um, I've seen a lot of programs, particularly in, in other industries, 
that do a lot of marketing to be able to do real-time data analysis followed up by almost immediate real-time targeted marketing. And so there's a lot there that can be done with Gen AI. So basically what we're talking about right now, because we're not talking about full automation, we're talking about augmentation, right now what we're thinking about is how do we take these AI tools to do one of two things, make more efficient the stuff that I already do, the routine stuff, and also keep in mind the second part of this is what are these tools gonna let me do that I haven't done before? The what comes next question. And to me that's one of the exciting questions is these tools aren't just about finding a new way to do the same thing you did before. And so part of when we think about how we're integrating these new technologies with our traditional marketing approaches, part of what we have to ask also is what in that traditional marketing space do we wish we could do that we haven't been able to do before? So one of the things I wanna note here is that yes, there are a lot of platforms out there. There are also a lot of people selling services to help companies, organizations integrate AI into their workflow. And um, just to clarify, uh, primarily because I do some of this kind of work and I'm hoping to do more of this kind of work also, is there's a difference when you're looking for somebody between an AI consultant who is somebody who will come in and build your own AI for the tasks you want performed, and then there are AI strategists who can come in, look at what your company does, look at what your organization does, and then using what's called an AI readiness survey, working with your, your personnel can figure out where are the stages to deploy AI in what you're already doing. And usually those aren't a sudden, we're gonna automate everything. Those are, let's start off by integrating some AI use in terms of how we're putting content out about sales or about events that are coming out, those kinds of things. So a lot of organizations are looking more for strategy than they are building their own uh, AI platforms. So the AI readiness, it's also where we need to focus on peer AI, where the AI works with you, versus management AI, where the AI takes over and does the work for you. This is that part of the strategy, is figuring out what you want AI to do on its own, let it go do it, and what you need to integrate with. So it's, again, as I've said, the difference between automation and augmentation. So everybody always asks me, all right, where do I learn about what platforms do what, where are they? Um, these are some sites that are very specific. They keep up to date with new platform releases. One of the crazy things in working with Gentech right now is that I can log on, download a platform, and two days later that platform's gone because another company bought it or they couldn't keep up. So these sites provide uh, updated AI releases. I also have, and I will, um, I will get it to either Rachel or Stephanie or somebody, um, I've been trying to build out a database of useful AIs for deployment, and I've got a list of about 275, 300 platforms on that. And I, I will admit, I gave up keeping up with it simply because the change is so fast, but it's a good place to start to look for, I really want an AI that will do this, 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 and this. So thank you for listening to me ramble. Um, we've got time, I wanted to make sure we had about 15 minutes uh, for Q&A because I find that in these sessions, the organic conversation becomes more generative than me just doing an info dump toward you all. So thank you for listening to me ramble. Um, and if there are Q&A, let's, let's do it. We have mics to uh, bring around. I see a hand over there. And we sure can't see the hands from up here, so. All right, so there are three. Let me start here. You. The mic's no. back there, I'm sorry. Oh, back okay. Yeah, sorry. I'll let you all moderate from there because <laughs> okay. I can't see. Yeah. Okay, so I guess I have two, maybe three questions. First, <laughs> Only? the tools. I know. <laughs> the tools that you just showed us, I guess knowing in the near future, based off of security concerns, we're not gonna be able to launch our own AI platform. But I do know that our site's gonna be scrubbed, right? What resources are out there to show us how to optimize our website for that type of crawling? Um, and then I'll let you answer that one first and then I'll ask the other one. Yeah, so there aren't a ton of resources for that yet. 
Um, that's why a lot of companies, right now also, I'm gonna take a side note here. Right now, it used to be that when you would ask companies what are they looking for in new employees, communication skills were always really at the top of that list, good written and spoken communication skills. That's still up there at the top, but now the number two thing is specifically this, it's AI literacy tied to data security. How are my employees gonna know how to protect my data? And a lot of that comes down to making a decision of what is my public facing data because you're not gonna put everything into that public facing data versus what is my proprietary data that I'm going to keep out of that. So for instance, if I were putting up information about a state and wanting to say, you know, we've got, you know, 150,000 new registered anglers this year, fishing is growing in, see Glenn's slides, that I would wanna put that data in a public kind of way. What I'm not gonna then do is also tie in all of that privacy information, who has the licenses, all of that remains separate. So part of what I don't want you to think about the, the platform and the data loading of it here is that you are gonna just open up everything to that. What you're specifically doing is picking that platform that is going to update web content, for example, but you're gonna tell it exactly what it can and can't use. Okay, and then the second one, and I have a photography background, so it's already been in the conversation for a long time, especially with Adobe and everything that's happened. But from a content creation side and thinking more of marketing materials like commercials and stuff, if we're utilizing AI in the context of editing, what is the copyright situation and is it, I mean, we share with our tourism partners our commercials based on the rights that we agree with those production companies and or in-house. Where do we go when it's AI generated? So great question, there are a million answers. I, I actually teach a class that we cover like a semester long talking about this, so I'm gonna try to keep it really, really brief. First of all, Anything that has been AI enhanced right now is not copyrightable. If I, so I use an example, um, I've got, I, a lot of my pictures end up in magazines because I write for a lot of fishing magazines, but a lot of times there will be a branch that's just messing up the picture, right? And aside from just cropping, which we've always done in photography, side note here, I, I always find it fascinating that we live in a culture that has phrases like Pixar it didn't happen or photographic evidence. Sorry, the moment that we invented photography, we invented photographic manipulation, whether it's you know big uh, nefarious manipulation or it's I cropped out a branch, right? So right now if you're AI adjusting anything, it's technically not copyrighted. And Adobe actually partnering now with over 100 companies has an authentication platform that you can check a picture to see if it's been adjusted in any way, where, you know, that this shark was actually taken from this picture and this helicopter from this picture and melded together. So there are more ways to do that. What this falls under is responsible use more than anything. And for us, in an industry that deals with the outdoors, this is a very, very tough thing to address from a responsible use position because melded into what we talk about with our outdoor experiences is also a concept of authenticity. That we, you know, we want to be able to think that the images that we're putting out there represent the outdoor places in our state authentically. We've all had that experience and you've probably seen the galleries of hotels that post pictures of these amazing beaches or incredible pools and then you get there and realize that they took a very specific angle and then stretch. You know. So for our industry that's a very interesting kind of thing. How are we going to represent the authenticity while using the AI and where are our own responsible use barriers? You know I'm okay taking a branch out. However, there was an event in North Carolina a few years back, uh, one of the dog agility uh, courses, cover photograph of a dog doing one of the water jumps and the, uh, the sponsoring organization sued the Charlotte Observer because they removed the leash from the dog because the editor didn't like the way the leash showed up in the picture, but that's a rule in their competition that that has to be there. So there are all kinds of ethical questions and responsible use questions we're gonna have to unpack. But as Shama said, and there we, this is early in the conversation, you know, very early. So. And then my last question, just trying to get ahead of it, you talked about prompt engineers. 
Where do you see someone even starting to explore that? Um, just knowing when I started in web, web is so different than even 10 years ago, right? And so a, a lot of stuff I just kind of learned on the fly, but this is, the barrier to entry is a lot more steep without that security background. I have a very simple, quick answer for you, and that way we can get on to the other questions. There are three AI prompt writing textbooks out there. They are terrible, don't use them. Um, <laughs> The best way to learn about prompt engineering is the internet. YouTube and TikTok, right now we're seeing a lot of people in industry doing tutorial videos on how they have developed their company's prompt engineering approaches. There's great stuff out there for free. Just start, yeah, you can do the more formal stuff like Khan Academy, Coursera, and the more formal, but really some of the best stuff are the folks that are out there actually doing this in a company right now. So. Thanks for the question. I know we've got others. In Nicole, work. I think you have a mic. Raise your hand so he sees where you are. I had her third question. I was going to ask where to start. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. We covered it. Another question? All the way in the back. I see a shadow. It's always on the opposite side of the room. Always. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you talked a lot about like having, I guess, um, a, not a strategist, a, a consultant come in to help you kind of build your own um, AI generating tool, but are there ways to point uh, a more a traditional AI towards content that you have so it, you don't end up with like the salmon incident, like photos that you have in your agency? Yeah, so a lot of the platforms that are subscription-based are designed for exactly that. So for instance, take it away from the photo for a minute. Let's say I wanted to have a chat bot on my website that would a answer the questions that we get asked every single day. There are tons of platforms for that. I work with a lot of teachers who do that for their classrooms for a given semester where you just take, here are all the answers to all the common questions and you put it in there. And then the AI is also updating as people use it. They, you know, so there are tons of platforms out there that are specifically designed for you put your content in and you tell us how it's gonna, how it's gonna respond. Thank yep. you. That, that, that's what we call no code platforms that doesn't require you as a user to know anything about AI or coding. It's like going back to what you said about web chain. You know, no, who needs to know XTML and HTML and CSS plus and R and all that stuff for writing web pages anymore? You go to Wix or GoDaddy or something, you get a template, you load it up. That's the same kind of concept with a lot of these no code platforms. A two part question. First, with, um, are there any best practices? I mean, I guess this is so early that there aren't any, but would you advise then if we do any AI generated photography or video that we just say it's Right, AI? so every time I get asked that question, my response is the only kind of best practice or policy or whatever you wanna call it at this point is transparency and documentation. Be upfront. This, you know, this, this article was enhanced with ChatGPT on such and such a date, or this image was updated using Adobe Photoshop's generative AI, uh, or just identify it. You know, you all are watching the news, you're seeing how much stuff is coming down on people who aren't citing information. Transparency and documentation, because all the other best practices are so ridiculously contextual that what you want to do with it is going to be very different than this person over here wants to do with it. And if we created a platform for both or created a policy for both, one of you isn't getting what you wanted. So transparency and documentation are the baseline best practice. Perfect. Thank you so much. I had one other follow-up in my feverish writing taking notes. Uh, what does LLM say? Large language model. Large, Think of it as just all of the information that it's using, all the data that a chatbot's using. We have time for another question. Steph, you have a question? Hi, I do. And I just want to commend Sid. I saw a similar presentation um, at the ASA Summit last fall, and things have already changed so much. It's incredible to watch that uh, transition. Um, I'm curious, I know this is new and evolving, but who in the marketing teams right now are taking the lead 
on AI? Is it the web folks? Is it the, you know, and where do you think it's going? Is it gonna totally change? Told you, Stephanie, I'm not making predictions. <laughs> So who is picking it up are the people who feel like they can see where it's gonna be deployed. So content creation is probably primary. And there are a lot of big questions about that too, right? You know, do I need, uh, do I need 12 writers on my marketing team or can I have one AI person who's gonna knock stuff out a lot quicker? So lots of content creation. Web design, particularly if your web pages are something that has to be updated on a regular basis, yeah, sure, it becomes very, very valuable. But if your web pages are pretty stagnant and stay that way for a year or so, yeah. This is exactly why, however, what Stephanie's asking about, about where to deploy, that doing something like an AI readiness uh, survey, where you're asking the people who are performing the task where they see the opportunities and what we're really ready to do and what we're not ready to do. Because a lot of people, and I'm guessing a lot of people in this room, hear these questions of how do I do this and they think I, I'm not ready to do this. My company works well as it is, we've been doing, so being able to do that kind of survey. But if you want a real challenge, and I'm, I'm giving away some of my paid content now, um, Ask the people in your different divisions to, under, to go, go through an exercise and warn them up front. This is an exercise. You're not actually doing this. To, for them to do the research to ask, what of my job, what of your job can you replace with AI? You don't, of course, want to then do that. <laughs> but it gives your employees and your, your organization and your company the opportunity to start thinking very specifically in terms of their task where deployment might happen. And then it also gives you a, an opportunity to see across the, the board. And I also recommend absolutely do not wholesale move everything into AI. Do lots of beta testing. You know, start trying it on, on uh, emails, start trying it on some little bits, see what works, see what doesn't. If you're just gonna jump into the deep end, we know what lurks in the deep end. So. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you, Sid. Thank you all much. very much. You can get me at Sid at inventivefishing.com. Be glad to talk with you more, be glad to charge you high rate bills, things like that, but thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank Sid. You.